Hello, and welcome to the Kathleen Spracklin Podcast. I am a woman on a mission, apparently to teach Zettelkasten, because that's what I've been up to lately. And we are in the middle of Adler's How to Read a Book. We are nicely underway in analytical reading. We started the first stage of analytical reading in our last podcast, and today we're going to conclude stage one of analytical reading. Last time we talked about the first question, and now we're going to pick up with questions two, three, and four of that stage. We are in chapter seven, X-raying a book. If you're following along, we're on page 75. I've got all the cards prepared, so join me in the down-facing camera. We've got two books we're working with here. We're going to be working with Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book, Learning to Do the Steps in Analytical Reading. And we've got our cards that we'll go through with those. And we're going to be working with Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. He's our example guy that we've been using uh, to illustrate Adler's steps. And we've got our cards ready for that as well. So let's get underway. We're here in Chapter 7, X-Raying a Book. And we're down here on page 75. Our rule number 2 is here at the bottom of the page. You'll remember that in Chapter 6, we covered Rule 1, which is where we were supposed to pigeonhole the book and determine what kind of a book we were dealing with. So here's our card for this second rule. State the unity of the book as a whole in one sentence or, at most, a short paragraph. And then as a quote, to find out what a book is about in this sense is to discover its theme or main point. We're going to be looking for its pervasive unity, as the author says. My reaction to this was, what is the author's central claim? Why did the author write the book? And my tagline to remember this card, find and state the point of the book, the author's why. And an alternative reading, find and state the central theme of the book, the author's why. The third rule is down here on page 76. Adler wants us to be able to state the major parts of the book, show how they are organized and how they relate to each other and to the unity of the book as a whole. And he says not just how it is one, but also we need to know how it is many as well. And my reaction to that was, what is the contribution of each part to the whole? And my tagline is, how do the parts of the book support its point? Alternatively, how do the parts of the book support its central theme? Now, Adler goes on and discusses this in rather great detail, which we won't go into, and he talks about several different examples that will help us address these two rules, rule two and rule three, so that we can see there how they're actually applied. I'll leave that to you to read those sections. I rejoin his work at on page 90, The Reciprocal Arts of Reading and Writing. Now, this is not another question, but this is very applicable to a Zettelkasten because, of course, in the Zettelkasten, we're capturing in writing what the uh, what we are reading. So we are doing both reading and writing in a, into a Zettelkasten when we read analytically. So I was very interested to know what Adler's point would be here. And the point that Adler is making is that, that the acts of reading and writing are reciprocal in that the reader uncovers the unity and the organization, whereas the writer starts with those things and fleshes them out. So I made the added point that the unity must be an idea, and for all but the simplest books, the parts will also be ideas. And my tagline is, find a book structure and you'll have its ideas. I captured another card on page 91. I really like this quote. A piece of writing should have unity, clarity, and coherence. And those are rules that I'm going to strive for in any of my own writing. I'm going to try very hard to make sure that they will pass this test. And so I made for my tagline that my writing might always display unity, clarity, and coherence. And now here on page 92, we are at the fourth and final rule in stage one of analytical reading. Adler wants us to find out what the author's problems were. What questions was he trying to answer? I'm 
So this is the main card I made for that question. Find out what the author's problems were. State the main and subordinate questions and put them in order. It's good to do this alongside rules two and three. Without this rule, readers will fail to see the unity of a book because they fail to see why it has the unity it has. And then my response is that I want to be sure that I know my questions as I write too. So my tagline is the author's questions drive the unity for my work too. And finally, over here on page 95, the last page of the chapter, Adler summarizes all four rules of the first stage of analytical reading. I put them down in a card, but I just used single words to capture them all because by now I better know them. And if I don't know them, I'm going to go back to the individual cards to look them up. So rule one is to classify the book. Rule two is to identify the unity of the book. Card three is identify the multiplicity, the subpoints. And number four is the questions that the author was asking. I want to keep these in mind for reading and for my writing. And so my tagline is stage run of analytical reading for valuable rules. So now it's time to put these rules to the test with the book we've been using for our example, Simon Sinek's Start With Why. So I began with the first question, classify the book. This is a, bus this is a business how-to book. It's a practical book. The second question, the second rule is identify the unity of the book. And so for this one, I said the only way to become and remain successful as a business is to know your why, share your why, hold tight to your why, and transmit your why to staff and customers alike. And then I added something here, which isn't in Adler's rules, which is to establish a unifying question. I think he implied that in rule four, but I wanted to make it explicit and to put it right here with the unity of the book. And so the unifying question that I think was in Simon Sinek's mind writing this book is why should we start with why? The third question is multiplicity. What are the parts? How do they hang together to support the unity and to support one another? I found that in going through the contents of Simon Sinek's book, a number of the parts actually were very good titles to explain what was going on in the part. In a few cases, I had to deviate. So I've got I did two things in conjunction with one another. I wanted to answer both the multiplicity, how, what, what are the parts and how do they fit together, and at the same time to answer those questions. What question did I think that Simon Sinek had in mind when he wrote each of these five parts? And I found that sometimes I could start with the description and easily deduce the question, and sometimes it was easier to come up with the question first and after that, to come up with the multiplicity. The first one was part one, I thought, described very well what the point that Cynic was trying to make in this part. A world that does not, doesn't start with why. It was covered very well, the, what, what you get in an organization if you're not starting with why. The corresponding question that goes along with that is that very question. What do you get if you don't start with why? Part two provided an alternate perspective to that world that doesn't start with why. And the question that went with part two, is there a, any other way besides manipulation? Manipulation was the what you got if you didn't start with why. So that's coming out of part one. Part three, I had to break it down into the two separate chapters. The two chapters are making separate points. One, the first part is how trust emerges. And the second part is how a product becomes a mass market product. They really uh, may be combined okay under the title of part three, which is leaders need a following, but I felt that, yes, it covers leaders need a following both within the organization and then within a, an individual product as it goes to market. Likewise, I had to have two questions. The first question was, how does a leader become trusted? And the second part was, what must be in place before a product can go mass market? 
Part four was how to put it all together. How do you make this happen within an organization? And the corresponding question is, how does this actually get applied? Part five covered how do you face challenges in an organization? What are the challenges to a why? And the corresponding question is, what makes companies lose sight of why? Finally, the last part talks about the origins of why, where did it come from in the business world, and the future of why. Is this going to be something that will be applying going forward in time? And the corresponding questions there were, how did this get started in business? How will this be important in the future? I hope you found it instructive to go through those steps in the first stage of analytical reading. I'm anxious to find out what's going to go on in the second stage. Are you? Join me in the next episode and we'll see what's ahead. And don't forget to actually do it.